So hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be attempting to platinum the Team Eco collection. If you're unfamiliar with their work, Team Eco was a studio responsible for Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and mainly responsible for The Last Guardian, before most of the group merged into Gen Design. Over time, this studio has gained a cult following, with many people regarding the Team Eco collection as some of the best games in modern history. This was definitely something that I wanted to experience for myself, so I set out with the goal to platinum all three games. Originally, I had a hard time deciding which game to start on, because even though Eco was released first, Shadow of the Colossus is technically set before Eco, making it a prequel, and also the first game in the timeline. I ultimately decided to play these games in release order, and started my adventure with Eco, originally released all the way back in 2001 for the PS2. As always, I will be showing these games off to their full potential, so this video will include spoilers for every single game. But with all of that out of the way, I think it's about time we start earning some Platinum Trophies. <laughs> The game starts out with a boy we later know as Eco, being banished from his village because he has horns. These horns are seen as a bad omen of sorts, and due to this, he is taken to an abandoned castle and locked up forever. Luckily, Eco manages to escape fairly easily, only being locked up for what seemed like 5 seconds before I was able to take control and start this platinum journey. I spent the first 20 minutes figuring out the controls for this game, because even though I was playing the remaster, the controls still felt a bit outdated. Once I figured it out though, I made my way up this super long stairway, where we can meet the main companion of this game, Yorda. To free Yorda, you have to flip this lever and make your way all the way down the staircase to save her from the shadows. These shadows were the main enemy throughout the game, and although they do no harm to you, they try their best to take Yorda away from you, and if they succeed, you do fail. It is here that we unlock our first trophy of the game for rescuing Yorda from the shadows and escaping the area. This was a short-lived victory though, as unless you constantly call Yorda to follow you, she will just stand in the same place you left her, eventually getting taken by the shadows. After restarting my game and reaching the same point, I sat on this bench in order to save my game. This would be a continuous thing to do throughout this game, not only to create a save, but to also earn the trophy bench warmer for sitting on all 14 benches. After defeating a few more shadows and warming up a few more benches, we eventually reach the main gate. And while at first it is open, the gate quickly shuts we end up meeting the main boss of this game, the Queen. After finishing this cutscene and lighting all the pillars, we can earn another trophy for meeting the Queen. This is where, for me at least, the game really started to pick up, as we were tasked with reopening the main gate. To open the east gate, we had to make our way through the graveyard. This was actually where I experienced my first death, due to jumping in the wrong direction and slamming my face into the wall. There would be a few more deaths in this run, and as you may have guessed, there is actually a trophy for not dying. However, this game only saves a death if you choose to continue rather than exit into the main menu. So basically, every time I messed up, I would just have to reload my previous save and try again. Which, to be honest, was actually pretty lenient compared to death-related trophies in other games. After trying again, I managed to defeat the shadows and progress onto the next area, which had a lovely bench waiting to be saved on. The next few areas went pretty well, as I managed to figure out a trick to do with Yorda. If you manage to reach the door before the shadows grab Yorda, she will blast open the door with her powers, which will conveniently eliminate all the shadows in the area, which is super handy. Eventually, we made it to the most important building on the east side, called the East Arena. Using a piece of wood as a torch, I opened the first door of the arena. This, of course, had a bench waiting outside for us but more importantly, allowed us to climb up the ladder and light up the next door in order to obtain the sword. After grabbing the sword and escaping this really poorly made trap, another trophy popped. This room actually gave me some trouble the first time around because of the outdated movement in this game. If you stop moving Eco, it usually takes a step or two before he actually stops moving. 
and in an area like this you can probably see why i struggled a bit eventually though i made it through the climbing section and turned the water off this allowed yorda to make it up the slope with relative ease and eventually create a path for us to open the final door of the arena As you may have guessed, this earned us another trophy. The journey to the West Arena was actually going pretty well until I was stopped in my tracks. You need to jump on this log at the correct time in order to be propelled into the air and move on to the next section. The issue was though, I just really couldn't do it. I blamed it on the controls, but I think it was more of a timing issue on my behalf. You have to jump just as the pillar is moving downwards. And after multiple failed attempts, I finally got it. In this area, there was a missable trophy for grabbing a secret weapon. And what I found really cool was that returning here on New Game Plus would not only give you a different weapon, but would also unlock another trophy. To unlock the trophy spiked club, you have to hit this tree to receive what I believe was an acorn, but look more like a massive stone boulder. Then you have to push your way through the secret entrance and stand on the pressure pad to activate this square box thing. With the ball in my hand, I essentially had to chuck the ball into the box to receive my weapon, which was easier said than done. This literally took me 10 minutes, and as much as I've grown to love this game, I have to blame this one on the controls. The only way to throw an object in this game is to be moving in that certain direction, meaning you cannot be stationary when you throw the ball. It left me with about a three second window of turning around and moving forward before I either threw the ball or it's too late and I'm too close to the box. After multiple failed attempts, this happened. All I had to do now was turn the water off and make my way to the next area to earn the trophy. After climbing a thousand feet in the air and blowing up this structure, we finally made it to the West Gate Arena. This is where we can sit on the final bench to unlock the trophy Bench Warmer. Now in the home stretch of opening the main gate, we just had to open all three doors within the arena by flipping a few levers and dealing with the swarms of shadows. I had a pretty close call in this area because as I mentioned previously, if you're not with Yorda for a long period of time, she will get jumped by the shadows. And conveniently placed in this area is a barricaded door that of course, you have to leave Yorda unattended on the other side. To open this door, you have to go into another room, which I believe triggers the game into thinking you've left her. After grabbing the bomb and making my way slowly back, Yorda makes this noise. This means that one of the shadows has her captive, and if I'm not fast enough, it essentially means restarting from my previous save. Luckily, this time around, I managed to save her from the depths of hell, and to thank me, she created a path allowing me to pull a lever and light up the final door of the arena. After leaving the arena, the trophy unlocked for opening the west gate. All that was left to do now was to open the main gate and finish the game. Or so I thought.
Watching this cutscene unlocks another trophy. And if you didn't really understand what just happened, <laughs> because I didn't either, the queen uses her powers to turn Yorda to stone, which is why she drops Eco and cannot move. After this, we enter my least favourite part of the game. Due to no longer having Yorda, it is impossible to save my game, and that meant for the whole time, I was constantly being cautious of my movements. This water area in particular had me climbing a bunch of stuff without falling off, and it took me so many attempts that I just stopped recording until I made it past, just to literally die in the next area and restart all the way back before the cutscene. Luckily though, after a few more attempts at the water area, I managed to return back to the same spot, before climbing down this tower and stumbling across the queen's sword. The sword was really cool to have as it allowed us to use the light, which is something only Yorda was able to do before. We can now open these big doors with the sword and in doing so, unlocked another trophy. After this, we see Yorda, still turned to stone, surrounded by shadows, and Eco just couldn't let that slide. We are forced to eliminate a ridiculous amount of shadows, before filling up all the stone coffins, and allowing us to enter the final, and in my opinion, best fight of the game. This fight was actually pretty fun, even though it wasn't super hard. To beat the queen, you have to use the sword to protect you from the waves of darkness and hit her shield before running back behind a pillar while you search for where the sword has landed. After repeating this a few more times, her shield breaks and Eko claims his first victim. Eko loses both of his horns, and I actually thought he was possibly dead at this point, but by defeating the queen, Yorda is freed from the spell and saves Eko in her shadow form, sending him off while the whole castle is falling apart. Eventually, Eko washes up on the beach, and after strolling around for a little bit, feeling empty inside because I thought Yorda was dead, something white caught my eye in the distance. Say 
This unlocked both Emancipation for finishing the game and Unscathed Escape for finishing the game without a death. Now, all that stood in my way of the Platinum was a two hour speedrun and two miscellaneous trophies. I actually presumed this would be pretty easy, but I could not have been more wrong. Two hours is genuinely not enough time for this trophy, as the current world record stands at an hour and a half. It's meant that for the casual player like myself, having literally 29 minutes spare compared to the genuine world record was practically impossible. The only way I managed to get anything close to this trophy was to watch the world record footage as I was playing the game. This was actually going pretty well in the first half. I figured out a few new tricks, like right here, you can leave Yorda and go off on your own adventure, skipping literally 30 minutes of game time by looping back around and grabbing her a bit later. What I came to realize during the speedrun is that the shadows only trigger when Yorda enters a certain room or passes a certain point in an area, essentially meaning that if Yorda stands in the correct spot, you can just do the majority of the game without worrying about the shadows. The graveyard is a good example of this, as by having Yorda stand on the stairs, you can focus on other things before purposely making the shadows spawn in. After making it past the graveyard, I was well on my way to earning this trophy. I made a bit of a detour at the waterfall to save my game a bit earlier on, because I wanted to grab the second secret weapon without damaging my runtime. To earn the trophy Shining Sword, you have to do exactly the same as before. Hit the tree, open the secret door, and throw the ball into the box. This unlocked the secret lightsaber, and it pained me to finally unlock this just to earn the trophy and restart from my previous save without the weapon unlocked. After opening the west side gate and making it back to the main gate, my final save time was 1 hour and 21 minutes, leaving me just 39 minutes to finish the remainder of the game and watch all the unskippable cutscenes. I made my way through the water area, slayed the queen in literally a minute and a half, and painfully sat through the final cutscene and long credits before washing up on the beach for one final trophy. To earn this trophy, I had to grab the watermelon only available in New Game Plus and make my way over to Yorda to hand it to her. In hindsight, I shouldn't have attempted this as Eco walks super slow while holding the watermelon and the timer I had previously set on my phone was telling me I literally had two minutes remaining. I eventually made it to Yorda, unlocking the secret ending and painfully sat there while the trophy started to pop, just praying I had made it with enough time. Now, I just want to point out that the timer on my phone told me I had beat the game in 1 hour, 59 minutes, and 26 seconds. So if I was literally 34 seconds behind on anything throughout my run, I would not have earned this platinum. It is definitely clear that this game was ahead of its time, and games such as Brothers, or even more recently, A Plague's Tale, have taken clear inspiration from this game. And it's crazy to think that this game still hasn't been released on current gen consoles. All in all, this game was actually pretty good. The controls feel a bit outdated, and I do think the story could have been explained a bit better, but if you can look past it, I think you'll have a pretty good experience. The next game to be released was Shadow of the Colossus, all the way back in 2005. This game was released to critical acclaim and was the go-to title for the PS2. Its ambitious open world and concept allowed it to stand out from most of the other PS2 titles at the time. I had previously played this one a few years back and reached the 10th Colossus before dropping the game. This does mean that I had some trophies unlocked, but I decided to do a blind playthrough to begin with anyways, so these would have been unlocked either way, as they were just for defeating each Colossus. It's not all amusement. I click. If the least do is Oh, 
After finishing the cutscene, I grabbed the trophy Trick Rider for doing every trick on aggro. Yeah! I then grabbed a second trophy for finding a mysterious barrel. This is a clear reference to The Last Guardian and something I believe was not in the original, making it more of an easter egg rather than a genuine reference to where Last Guardian stands in the timeline. After clearing up these two trophies, I decided to take on the first Colossus, Valus. The first few Colossi served more as a tutorial rather than actually being hard. It allowed me to quickly get to grips with the controls and use the sword to reveal the vitals. After climbing up his back, I stabbed him three times and watched him fall as the darkness of Dormant could see my body. Upon defeating the first Colossus, Dorman will not only explain where the next Colossus is located, but will also explain the importance of the shrines. Now apparently, on the PS2 version, these served as save points, much like the benches from Eco. However, with the ability to save on the go on the PS4 version, these serve as easy ways to replenish health and can be used as a checkpoint if you'd like to respawn closer to the Colossus. There is a trophy for praying at every shrine, but this is something that can easily be cleaned up towards the end of the playthrough. As I made my way through each Colossus, I started to become more and more involved in this world, and it slowly became clear why this game is rated so highly. The vast open plains of the Forbidden Lands, the mystery of defeating each Colossus, and the unique question of what happens next genuinely kept me intrigued at every moment. Come the 10th Colossus, I had seen so much that I just didn't want it to end. The uniqueness of defeating the 3rd Colossus by breaking its wrist guard, the feeling of being clueless on how to defeat Avion before jumping on its wing and soaring through the skies, and even the mysteriousness of Colossus 7, only being able to defeat it by patiently waiting on top of the deep water and stabbing each vital point to counter the electricity. Every single Colossus had a completely unique fight, and I just couldn't stop playing. I even managed to earn the trophy for defeating the 8th Colossus without letting it turn over, something I actually wasn't aiming for at the time, but it just goes to show how much fun I was having. <laughs> Now I will say, not every single Colossus had me feeling this sense of enjoyment, specifically the 4th and 9th Colossus, but this didn't really phase me too much as I was more excited for the mystery of each Colossus that came after them. The 10th Colossus was the last one I could remember, and I believe this was the last Colossus I defeated before I previously dropped the game. After figuring out how to defeat this one, I got to work shooting its eye with my bow, before jumping on its back and destroying its vital point. After doing this one last time, the 10th Colossus fell, and after a brief summary of the next Colossus by Dorman, I was left to my own accord. This was that feeling that I had been waiting for, the sense of complete mystery. And to be honest, I believe this is the true experience of Shadow of the Colossus. As much as I'd love to showcase each and every Colossus, this video will be 10 times longer than it already is. So, to keep it at a minimum, here is me defeating the 11th Colossus. And then the 12th Colossus. And then Colossus 13, which was an extremely cool fight where you have to shoot it down from the sky and stab its back. And Colossus 14, which to be honest was one of the weaker late game fights in my opinion. And then finally, the 15th Colossus, which had one of the best introduction cutscenes in the game.
Now I had reached a point where only a single Colossus remained, and I was actually surprisingly invested for the ending, and also what the last Colossus would even look like. However, before attempting the last Colossus, there were a few more miscellaneous trophies to clean up, which would make it a lot easier for me in the long run. The first of which was shooting a lizard with an arrow. <coughs> then, I decided to earn two trophies in a single go. One for defeating the third Colossus without breaking its wrist guard, and another one for defeating a Colossus in reminiscence mode. Reminiscence mode is pretty much how it sounds. You go to the location of the desired colossi, hold circle or R2 depending on your controls, and reminisce on the fight you had with that colossus. As I was combining these two trophies, of course, I chose to reminisce the fight with the third colossus, and got to work trying to defeat it without breaking its wrist guard. This was actually a lot harder than it seems, because there are only two ways to really do it. The first way, which is apparently the easiest way, is to climb onto its sword and wait for the colossus to wave its sword around, supposedly giving you a little boost up to the wrist guard. This unfortunately didn't work for me, and after many failed attempts, I resorted to the second technique, which was to grab onto the end of the sword and use the motion to propel yourself onto the top of the wrist guard. This surprisingly worked first time, and after doing a drive-by on its stomach, I unlocked both Resist the Wrist and the Path that Defines Thee for defeating this colossus. The only thing left to do now was to pray at all shrines. I had been praying at certain shrines throughout my playthrough, but this wasn't enough to be anywhere close to the trophy. So, I got to work, making my way slowly around the map, praying at shrine after shrine after shrine. With only a few shrines remaining at this point, I reached the west side of the map, and it was here that I stumbled across something that I really wanted to show you all. This is dubbed by the community as the Eco Beach, and has striking similarities to the beach at the end of Eco. For example, this rock right here looks like the rock that has the watermelons behind it in Eco. And to top it all off, in the PS4 remaster, they actually added the watermelon as a very clear reference to Eco. This was such a cool place to stumble across, and if anything, made me love the game just that little bit more. Wrapping up the last few shrines needed for the trophy, I made my way to the 16th Colossus, which conveniently housed the final shrine of the game. After using my ancient sword to open the gate, I prayed at the final shrine to unlock the trophy. Losing Agro was something that I didn't see coming, and it genuinely filled me with a bit of sadness. With the sadness in mind, I slumped my way up to the 16th Colossus, climbing up the walls and jumping between platforms until I finally reached the top. This was genuinely the most coolest and most daunting introduction of a Colossus thus far, and it really put into perspective that this was the last Colossus. After taking my first few steps into the fight, a massive fireball came shooting my way, and I instantly realised that this was nothing like I had previously experienced. This final fight was a pretty unique way to end the game off, and even just getting to the actual Colossus was a piece of work. Dodging the fireballs by going underground and then coming back up just to face a whole load more fireballs. But after finally making it under the Colossus, I had to scale all the way up its back and stab its vital, which, just like the 15th Colossus, was actually used in a way to benefit the fight. The Colossus will move its hand to its back, allowing you to jump onto its hand and give you access to climb up its arm, in order to stab another vigil. This prompts the Colossus to move its other hand over, allowing you to climb onto that hand, and then finally, jumping from its hand and barely making it to the ledge around his neck. From here, it was a pretty simple case of jabbing its head a few times, and before I knew it, the game was over. Sixteen different colossi defeated in only a few hours, but it was the best few hours I think I have spent gaming in a long time. Closing the game off was a pretty good ending. I do think the story could have been explained a bit better throughout the game, but after a quick Google search post-game, I got clued up pretty fast. The entity speaking to you from the light was called Dorman, 
and he was split into 16 colossi to pretty much never have any power again. Wanda steals a sword and enters the Forbidden Lands to revive Mono, presumably out of love. He, as you know, defeats all 16 Colossi with the hope that Mono will be revived and unwillingly acts as a host for Dormant to gradually get his power back. Now that you have more information than I did at this current point, enjoy the cutscene. <laughs> No Zeus! Once we can control Dormin, press an X or triangle depending on your controls will activate Dormin's rage, and this earned another trophy. This part didn't really make much sense to me, as I understand they're all running away from Dormin, but it's a bit anticlimactic to be playing as this massive entity just to hardly use any powers because they've all ran off. The light from the ancient sword pretty much destroys Dormin and also removes all darkness from Wanda's body. At the same time, Mono actually wakes up, which is something I didn't expect because Dormin, from what I believe, is gone for good now. So it was cool to see that he still kept his part of the agreement. What was even more shocking to me was that Agro spawned in out of nowhere, providing a pretty nice touch to the ending of the game. And now, with the credits rolling, we see that the pool is no longer filled with water, but instead has a baby with horns that is allegedly Wanda. I can only speculate that this is the major reason to suggest why Shadow of the Colossus is set before Eco, as the whole plot of Eco is based around children with horned features. Mono, Agro, and baby Wanda then make their way up to the secret garden, where they are greeted by all the wildlife. And then the game ends, earning me two trophies, one for finishing the game and the other for not dying in my playthrough. After completing the game for the first time, the trophy I decided to aim for next was called Speed King. This was for completing the time attacks in both normal and hard mode on the same save. Time attacks in the game are the equivalent to speedruns and give you a set time to defeat each Colossus in. Each Colossus has a different goal time and this is where it can get kind of challenging on the harder difficulty. 
However, the time attacks and normal difficulty were a breeze. I found most of them only took one or two tries because of the fact I had just finished my normal difficulty run a few hours prior. The time attack on the 8th Colossus was conveniently when I grabbed another miscellaneous trophy called Skilled Warrior. To achieve this, you must use a downward stab to finish off the Colossus. Now at this point, I had no clue it was even possible to do a downward stab. So after doing a bit of practicing with the button combination, I eventually figured it out. I jumped down to the bottom, shot the Colossus down to the ground, and finished it off with a downward strike to earn the trophy. Once defeating a certain amount of colossi, the pool at the end of the shrine will glow, and a reward will be waiting when you go and interact with it. This could be a weapon, an arrow, a cloak, or even a new skin for aggro. All of these had useful benefits when it came to defeating a colossus out in the world, and it really came in handy a bit later on. Once defeating the 16th Colossus with just a minute to spare, I went ahead and cleared up the last few miscellaneous trophies that I had left, just so I could focus solely on the more important trophies for the rest of the game. The first miscellaneous trophy was called Trick Arrow Skills, and requires you to shoot a lizard with a special arrow. These arrows are only available from the time attacks, which is why I had to leave this one so late. The next trophy was called Animals of the Land, and required you to interact with all the animals of the land. There are four animals in the entirety of the Forbidden Lands, and the first one I stumbled across was the dove. I figured out pretty quickly that the doves seemed to have a set path, so instead of chasing them around, I decided to wait it out, eventually being able to grab one of the doves and take this animal off my list. <laughs> The next and probably most irritating animal was the hawk. These guys just wouldn't get close enough to even be in a grabbable reach. And on top of that, the only way to have enough height is to stand on top of aggro, which eventually slows him down before coming to a complete stop. So after about five seconds of standing on aggro's back, he gives up and the hawks fly away. Eventually, I just had to move on from the hawks as I felt it was literally impossible. That was until I noticed that by riding up a slope while the hawks swoop down, there is just enough distance between aggro and the hawks for me to actually grab one. After this, only two animals remained, and I knew exactly where to find one of them. Outside the entrance of the 8th Colossus, there is quite an amazing looking location. Probably one of my favourite colossi locations in the game. But inside the lake outside the entrance, there is a bunch of fish swimming around. And after grabbing onto a fish's body and going for a little joyride, only one animal remained. Now I'm going to be honest, this animal actually had me stumped. I had no clue what animal was left, and to be honest, I don't even think I've seen a fourth animal in my original playthrough, and I didn't really know what to do. So I did what anyone else would do, I admitted defeat and looked online, which gave me the answer in a matter of seconds. After arriving at the location, I found the extremely small turtle that had me stumped for half an hour, and after literally touching it with my pinky toe, the trophy popped. The last miscellaneous trophy was to eat a fruit, something that I probably should have done ages ago, but I didn't really understand the significance of them until a little bit later. With every single miscellaneous trophy now out of the way, I double checked just to make sure I had earned all the time attack items, and then I created a new game plus using the same save, this time starting the game in the hardest difficulty. The only difficult aspect to these harder time trials were the shorter time limits, but also the addition of a third vital point, Albeit, some of the colossi still only had one or two. To be honest, most of the fights were relatively simple. However, the addition of an extra vital point with less time to do it in really did make for some close calls. I also surprisingly encountered my first and only glitch in this run with the 10th Colossus. For some reason, aggro just wouldn't move in the correct position, and I ended up getting hit by the Colossus. This led me to getting clipped into the wall, breaking the camera, and then falling to my death causing me to get jump scared by the PNG of the 10th Colossus. The rest of the Colossi were pretty easy until I made it up to the 15th Colossus. This was genuinely the hardest one out of the hard time trials in my opinion, and it had me stumped for about an hour. The third vital point was on its chest, which originally didn't seem too bad until I actually got to its chest and realized that he just wouldn't stop moving. Every single time I'd go in for even the tiniest stab, he would just activate rage mode and swing me about until half my grip had disappeared. This happened numerous times and to be honest, I just stopped recording the fails until I actually managed to get his health low enough for the vital point to disappear. I still actually have no clue how this is done and I don't know if it's just down to luck or if there is a specific spot that makes you immune to the shakes, but this was not a fun fight in the slightest on the hard time attack. 
But after the chest vital, it was simply a case of stabbing its hand a few times until he fell with about a minute to spare. <laughs> The 16th Colossus was super easy this time around because I managed to sit on his head in a spot that rarely ever interrupted my stabs, which basically allowed me to defeat it in a pretty decent time. Now that every single Colossus had been defeated in both normal and hard time attacks, I could grab all the hard time attack items to finally unlock this trophy. <laughs> By defeating the 16th Colossus, it unlocked the Queen's Sword, which was another really cool reference to Eco. Also, fun fact, this sword didn't glow in the original PS2 game, but Bluepoint decided to make it look identical to the one found in Eco and added the glow effect to the PS4 remake. The Queen's Sword is one of the most powerful weapons in the game, destroying most vital points in a single blow. Now that I had basically achieved God status, I set out for the Speed Demon Trophy, which requires you to beat the game in under 5 hours and 41 minutes. This was extremely fun with the Queen's Sword because I was basically one-shotting every boss in the game. I even unlocked a trophy for using the Queen's Sword and the Colossus. And after plowing my way through the game, I knocked the trophy speed demon with extreme ease. And in case you're wondering, I beat the game in just over two hours, which is absolutely crazy to me. I will say, this trophy is definitely possible without the Queen's Sword, and it could probably even be done on your first attempt of the game. But I was having so much fun at this point that using the Queen's Sword didn't really bother me that much. Now, onto the home stretch of the Platinum, the last hurdle was to max out all of Wanda's health and stamina. I played through the game once more before realizing that only my stamina was increasing. And after a quick Google search, I finally understood that eating the fruit is the main way to increase your health. With this newly found information, I scoured the whole map eating every piece of fruit I could find. And after eating around 60 or so fruits, I finally realized that my health bar had stopped growing. All I had to do now was reach max stamina, and there was two main ways to do this. The first way is to play the game five whole times, which takes around an hour and a half per playthrough. Or you can defeat the first and second Colossus over and over again, which is the faster and more efficient way. I chose to rinse and repeat the first and second Colossus, and in doing so, quickly maxed out my stamina bar extremely efficiently. The last two trophies to the Platinum were the ones I chose to personally leave till last. These felt like such an amazing send off for such an amazing game, and I'm so glad I chose to do it this way. With my stamina maxed out, I was now able to climb to the top of the shrine, and what I found extremely interesting was that on the PS2 version, this was a completely hidden secret. Since the PS2 had no trophies detailing this task, determined players maxed out their health and stamina just to attempt this climb that they had no clue would even be possible. And I just think that would have been such a cool secret to stumble across in a game as big as this. As I slowly reached the top of the shrine, my stamina bar progressively got lower and lower, until it suddenly became clear why max stamina was needed. Once at the top of the shrine, I made my way to the secret garden and instantly got reminded of the ending cutscene of the game. The fact you can even explore up here is such a cool secret, and I can't imagine what the PS2 players felt as they discovered this. This place was such a fitting way to send the game off, and after exploring for a little bit, I shot down the forbidden fruit and unlocked one of the last trophies remaining. All that was left to do now was to run across the bridge and reach the entrance of the Forbidden Lands. This bridge was so long that it basically overlooked every Colossi location on the map, and after running for a while, I started to actually reminisce on how great this game actually was. All the unique fights, all the unique locations, the weapons, the vast open land, and the sense of mystery as you travel to your next Colossus. This game was genuinely amazing, and as I slowly approached the entrance of the Forbidden Lands, I gradually came to the realization that this is the final trophy. I hadn't felt this feeling for a game in years, and yet here I was, at the final task of the game. As I approached the entrance, I tried to escape the Forbidden Lands, and in doing so, unlocked the Platinum Trophy. Just before I went to turn my game off, a sound started playing that I had not heard before. I thought maybe it was just the entrance of the Forbidden Lands, but as I moved around, I noticed it got louder and quieter depending on where I stood. After a few minutes, I eventually found a glowing object on the floor and picked it up. This random object gave me absolutely nothing, no new items or anything on the map, and I was genuinely intrigued. After doing a bit of research, I found this video by Jacob Geller that explained how a massive group of players spent years and years hunting for one last secret on the original PS2 game. 
one last task for them to complete. And in the remaster, Bluepoint Games gave him exactly that, one more task. Find all 79 coins and in return, well, I'm sure most of you already know. This was absolutely crazy to me. And in my immediate excitement, I straight away set out to grab them all. This was quite a long task, but it sent me to places I had never seen before. Parts of the map that I would never have even explored had it had not been for grabbing these coins. I loved the fact this was even possible. And after grabbing the last coin, I made my way to collect my reward. I genuinely highly recommend this game to you all. Hands down, it's a 10 out of 10 game, and I think everyone should experience this at least once. I understand that Shadow of the Colossus has probably taken up the majority of this video, but I genuinely think this is one of the best games I've ever played, so I wanted to do it justice. Last but not least, we have The Last Guardian. It's no secret that this game went through development hell, as it saw multiple issues over the years, along with an entire studio change from Team Eco to Gen Design. This was a game originally intended for the PS3, but it quickly came to light that it was impossible for Team Eco to produce the game they wanted to produce without an upgrade in the hardware. From what I can tell, with Team Eco closing in 2011, development shifted to Japan Studios, and then to Gen Design in 2014, also moving the development to the more advanced hardware of the PS4. Fast forward a few years, and in 2017, The Last Guardian was released to a pretty decent reception, and sold decently well, all things considered. I had pretty high hopes for this game after finishing Shadow of the Colossus, and I have to say, this one did surprise me a lot. I decided to make my first playthrough dedicated to the trophy All Talked Out, which requires you to listen to every single hint. This is an infamously buggy and unreliable trophy in this game, that many people consider the make or break for their platinum journey. I thought getting this one out of the way first would save me some hassle down the line, and while this was true, it was definitely a grind. The game starts out with a boy, literally known as the boy, waking up next to a beast called Trico. Straight off the bat, it is possible to earn a trophy for balancing two barrels on top of each other. These barrels are used to feed Trico, and are required for a trophy called Lock, Stock and Barrel, for collecting every single one. Balancing the barrels was a pretty tedious task, but after a few failed attempts, I earned the trophy. It is here that we can also listen to the first few hints of the playthrough. I think the main issue with listening to every single hint is exactly that. They're hints and they're only given when the game believes you're stuck. This means that for the majority of the first playthrough, I would just be standing around for minutes on end, waiting for the hint to pop up before moving on to the next one. This was okay at first, but as you'll see later, it started to get progressively less and less tolerable. After feeding Trico all three barrels, I removed the spear from his back and got knocked unconscious. Upon waking up, I made my way through this hole in the wall and grabbed the mirror. Using the mirror, Trico would shoot electricity from his tail, allowing me to break through the next area and eventually make it outside for the first time. <laughs> It is here that I was instantly met with my first broken hint. This one took a ridiculous amount of time to trigger, even restarting the game or the save made zero difference, until eventually, after literally 20 minutes of being AFK, the narrator said the fabled words. This is also where I stumbled across the first and second Trico hole. These were little gaps throughout the world, just big enough for Trico to reach his head through. And with 15 of them scattered all over the land, this was another collectible trophy to be earned throughout this first playthrough. A little while after this, the boy and Trico approach their first antenna room, and Trico's eyes suddenly turn red, showing that he is pretty worried about this area. Once gaining the courage to jump in, Trico sees how close we are to getting 10k subs and goes crazy, eventually eating the boy for not subscribing. This triggers the first story-related cutscene in the game, and although it didn't really give any major information, it was cool to see a glimpse of what was to come. Upon waking up without the mirror, I was required yet again to sit for an unbelievably long time for yet another hint. <laughs> this area was also where we encountered the first group of enemies called Armored Soldiers. These are the main group of enemies in this game, and they don't really pose too much of a threat to you unless they're able to grab you. 
Likewise, the boy is unable to do any harm to these enemies either, instead relying on Trico to do all the work for you. After every enemy encounter, Trico's eyes will stay red in anger, and it is your job to pet Trico and calm him down, bringing him back to reality. I made my way up this chain to reveal a really beautiful part of this game. The contrast between the dark area with the chain to the open land with the high contrast bloom was just a really neat design. It was also here that I suddenly came to the realization that Last Guardian is a mix of both Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. The whole aspect of calling Trico to your location is a clear nod to the mechanic used in Eco. And the climbing mechanic with Trico is of course the same mechanic used in Shadow of the Colossus. This game is a mixture of both their previous titles and this realization actually changed my perspective on the game. I was no longer searching for the Shadow of the Colossus follow-up that I had originally hoped for, but I was now viewing this game from a new lens, as its own standalone title. Of course, it goes without saying that this game has its flaws, and maybe to an extent does still play like a PS3 title, but that didn't really phase me too much anymore, because I was no longer judging it so harshly. This pretty special scene was quickly disrupted by the appearance of another Trico. Our Trico didn't like this interaction very much, and to be honest, it shocked me just as much as it shocked him. I was not expecting there to be another Trico, and this little appearance started to create a few questions in my mind. How many other Tricos were there? Why was there more than one in the first place? And why was our Trico so scared of the other one? This surprisingly brought a sense of mystery to the game that I had previously felt in Shadow of the Colossus. The next few areas are pretty simple, fighting a few armored soldiers, listening to a few more hints, and feeding Trico a few barrels, before unlocking the ability to point Trico in a certain direction, which was actually a really handy feature. This made directing Trico 10 times easier, as I could guide Trico while on his back, eliminating the need to call him over to a certain spot. A bit later on, we get introduced to the Talisman, which is a cool pattern on a glass plane that stops Trico in his tracks, making his eyes red and unable to pass until the Talisman are broken. This is conveniently when I unlock the trophy, The Call of Nature, for catching Trico in the act. With this trophy off my mind, I broke both the glass planes and hopped on Trico to move on to the next area. This area was actually the first one that had me stumped for a few minutes. After figuring out that you need to push the talisman off the rails, a chain reaction occurred, taking me and the whole platform down with it. This was actually the first death in my game this far, and with no manual saves like Eco and Shadow of the Colossus, it was already too late and the death had been accounted for. There is a death related trophy in this game that I would now have to achieve in another playthrough. After attempting this area again, I avoided the takedown of the platform, and this is actually when another new mechanic is introduced, as Trico is able to catch the boy with his mouth. <laughs> After repeating this for a second time, the whole platform starts to fall apart, and this time, we are caught by Trico's tail. Being caught by Trico's tail is surprisingly one of the miscellaneous trophies in this game that can easily be farmed a bit later on into the story, so I wasn't super focused on it at the moment. Skipping forward a tiny bit, we eventually reach a point in the game where Trico falls hungry and will refuse to do anything unless he's fed a barrel. The barrel in question was all the way at the bottom of this hole in complete darkness. To get the barrel back to Trico, you have to aim your throws perfectly, making sure that the barrel doesn't fall back to the bottom of the hole. This actually took me a solid amount of tries, as the throwing mechanic in this game is a bit finicky. After multiple failed attempts, I finally managed to get the barrel to Trico and progress onto the next area. This area was one of the more jaw-dropping parts of the game for me. The big open scenery, climbing across a long rope, and actually climbing up leaves just like in Shadow of the Colossus, really kept me wanting to explore more and more of what this game had to offer. A little while after this, we can unlock the trophy for finding every Trico hole. 
In this area, there were six holes that Trico could fit his head into. And after triggering the last one, the trophy popped. <laughs> after diving deep down into the water with Trico, the boy eventually loses his breath and lets go of Trico, washing up in a completely random area all alone. This was conveniently where another lovely broken hint was located, and it took way too long before, after a good 15 minutes of waiting, it eventually triggered. This was the first instance of actually seeing the other Trico up close, and I'm going to class this as a boss fight, even though technically you can't actually deal any damage. To survive the fight, you have to maneuver your way around the beast, using the leaves and the boy's small size as an advantage. I actually thought it was pretty cool that you're required to jump on the beast's head in order to progress forward just scraping the idea of death and eventually making it to this cage. This cage pretty much made me invincible and I was just thrown around like a doll before a mysterious signal caught the beast's attention and it ran off to subscribe to the channel. This is conveniently when Trico comes to the rescue and yet again, I was plagued by another long hint. For this one, you have to trap yourself below this ledge and have Trico push you up, which should trigger the hint. The only issue was, this one was extremely temperamental. I think this actually may be the most temperamental one of the whole game because I actually received this hint straight away in my second playthrough, and yet here I was for at least 25 minutes just waiting for it to trigger. A little while after this, we stumbled across the second antenna room, and I decided to use this one to earn the trophy Keep On Running which requires you to avoid Trico eating you for three whole minutes. This really wasn't too hard, and after breaking Trico's ankles for three whole minutes, the trophy popped. And then once he ate me, we gained a whole lot of information regarding the story. We see that Trico came to our village, grabbed us from our sleep, and then while being attacked from the people of the village, flew into the air until he was struck by lightning. The armored soldiers found Trico, and after taking him to the desired spot, lowered him into the cave that we started in right at the beginning of the game. At this current moment, there still wasn't enough information to understand the whole story, but it gave me enough information to understand how the boy got here and why our Trico was not like the other one. The bond between Trico and the boy was clearly growing stronger, as upon awakening, Trico was clearly regretting what he had just done. Trying everything he could to wake us up from the antenna incident, the boy eventually woke up and you can just see the excitement that Trico was in. As I mentioned earlier, there was a point later in the story that earned the trophy for being caught by Trico's tail 10 times. This right here was that moment. In Trico's dire need of being saved, I ultimately decided to farm his tail. Climbing right to the top of his head, I could drop down and it would trigger this cool slow motion scene that ended in the boy grabbing its tail. After doing this nine more times, the trophy popped. <laughs> Eventually, the boy and Trico get jumped by the other Trico, and at this point, I'm just going to call it Trico 2. Trico 2 starts approaching the boy before our Trico goes in for the kill. He quickly gets bested by Trico 2, and then it's down to us to save Trico from this fight. After patiently waiting for another hint, I dropped a massive trailer on top of Trico 2, which ended the fight pretty quickly. However, our Trico was absolutely beat at this point, and he ended up falling even further from the bridge to the ground. Instead of helping him though, another hint had to be heard. Now that we had the mirror back in our possession, I used it to grab multiple barrels for Trico to eat. With Trico back up to normal health, we managed to escape the depths we had fallen into and made our way up these towers, using the mirror to eliminate some of the soldiers. 
Eventually, we reach a point where Trico has no choice but to spread his wings and fly for the first time since falling out of the sky. The fact that Trico could fly opened up a whole load of possibilities and really got me guessing how this game was going to end. After one of the bigger fights in the game, we could use the mirror to finally enter the Sentinel Tower. This tower would serve as the final building of the game and in my opinion was one of the coolest places the game had to offer and you will soon see why. To activate this lift, you have to climb down Trico's tail and place your mirror in each of these little podiums. The only issue though, was that most of these podiums were blocked by armored soldiers. And this caused me to waste multiple minutes just running around in circles, waiting for an open gap to place my mirror into and then repeat. What I failed to realize at this point was that this area could be cheesed pretty easily by using the mirror to electrocute the soldiers with Trico's tail. Something I ended up figuring out at the later playthrough. Once placing the mirror in every location, the roof opened and I could use the lift to reach the next area. This area housed the final armored soldier fight of the game and was actually one of the only fights in the game that genuinely required the boy's help. You see, some of the armored soldiers will hold a talisman as a shield, which as you know, will cause Trico to get scared. To combat this, you need to roll into the enemy, causing its shield to be dropped and allowing Trico to carry on with his massacre. Once the platform had stopped, I quickly made my way to the final barrel of the playthrough. After a few tries of getting Trico to actually eat it, I finally got the trophy. This was the master of the valley, the entity responsible for controlling the other Trico and also responsible for controlling the armored soldiers. This was the final hurdle of the game and one that took me a few tries to figure out. To make it past the master of the valley, you need to use the mirror to suppress the darkness, giving you just enough time to make it to the top of the metal ball before continuing to climb up towards the top. Once at the top, I could use the mirror to stop the blades, allowing Trico to reach the top of the Sentinel Tower. This area was hands down the most beautiful part of this game. I was actually so surprised at how good this looked and if anything, I genuinely thought it was the end of the game. But of course, it wouldn't be that easy. I was actually left with no words and I couldn't believe how many Trico's existed after believing there was only two the entire time. On top of that, I was still in shock that the barrels used to feed Trico were actually created from the children stolen from the villagers. Essentially meaning that if the lightning strike didn't hit Trico, the boy that we play as would have just been another meal for the armored Trico's to eat. While Trico was getting slammed by all the armored Trico's, I remembered to touch every single enemy beast, unlocking the trophy Cryptozoologist. <laughs> Of course, I had to try my best to save Trico, and after seeing the mirror in the corner of my eye, I knew what I had to do. I sprinted for the mirror, but unfortunately, it was too late. I actually really believed at this point that me and Trico were pretty much screwed. Without his tail, 
I had no clue what I was meant to do. Until I remembered, the master of the valley controls the armored Trikos. I quickly sprinted to the severed tail, dragged it down to the master, and used the mirror in hopes I was right. With the master of the valley gone, the armored Trikos were no longer under control and backed away from Trico before falling off the tower. Trico eventually came over, saved us from the collapsing tower, and then we flew away. There was something surprisingly special about this moment that stuck with me. The fact that after being the underdog for the whole game, our Trico was now the only Trico strong enough to do anything. The only Trico capable of flying, and the only Trico that was actually free. What made this moment even better was that Trico was not just flying for the fun of it. He was returning the boy back to the village. The connection between Trico and the boy had grown so much that I actually didn't want this story to end. But of course, all good things must come to an end. When the credits rolled, I sat back in my chair and thought, wow, this game was actually really good, but the ending could have been a bit better. After sitting through the final credits of the game, one more cutscene played.
This was literally the ending I was looking for. The ending that told me that Trico was still alive and well, and that the boy was still surviving too. This ending wrapped up the game for me perfectly, and I quickly got to work earning the last few trophies to the Platinum. As you may have noticed, the trophy all talked out didn't actually end up popping. This was a little bit worrying for me, as I had read online that sometimes the hints just don't register, leading me to believe that I would possibly need to redo all the hints all over again. The only hint I knew I 100% had missed was hint 32, because I had progressed too far and it became unobtainable in the previous run. I played through the beginning of the game again, just hoping that my game didn't break and that this was genuinely the only hint I needed for the trophy. After grabbing the barrel and teasing Trico for a bit, I finally heard the hint that I had missed. I was actually over the moon at this point because all talked out, collar, and lock, stock, and barrel had now all been earned, meaning it was just a case of doing a cleanup run and then a speed run. The cleanup run was surprisingly fun and I had a good time attempting some of the challenges for the trophies. The trophy, Get Off My Back, required you to hold onto a soldier's back for 30 seconds. I chose to do this pretty early on and I got this one straight away only on my first or second try. Something that I failed to mention before was that in New Game Plus, there was a new menu detailing rewards for collecting a certain amount of barrels. Up to this point, I had collected 65 barrels, which was enough for me to unlock every outfit in one go. And what I found pretty cool was that there was an outfit dedicated for both Shadow of the Colossus and Eco. And after unlocking the trophy for equipping them all, I ultimately decided to stick with the eco outfit, as I thought it looked the best. In this same area, there was three trophies that could be unlocked. The first one being for hitting an enemy with a barrel 20 times. In this game, progress towards a certain trophy counted even if the chapter was restarted. I believe this was due to the game constantly saving in the background, as it was impossible to actually manually save. This was something that was able to work in my favour though, as I was technically able to spawn in, grab the barrel, hit the soldier, and then restart the save. Doing this 20 times in a row earned me the trophy pretty easily. The other two trophies in this area were earned the exact same way too, having Trico defeat 20 soldiers while holding the boy and not this trophy. And ripping the heads of the soldiers 10 times and not this trophy. A bit later on, when you're first introduced to the more advanced ways to guide Trico, there is a crate with three barrels inside. As you may have guessed, this is another great area to farm a trophy called Practice Makes Perfect. To earn this one, you have to get Trico to catch a barrel in midair 20 times, which was actually a pretty big ask when the game is so temperamental when it comes to Trico eating the barrels. The best way I found to get this done was to aim the barrel slightly to the left of Trico's mouth and hold square, which around 50% of the time, would result in Trico actually catching the barrel. After restarting this checkpoint a few times, the trophy finally popped. I just thought I'd point out that while going through this miscellaneous run, I was still being required to collect every single barrel for a trophy that would be unlocked a little bit later. The next trophy I unlocked was called Broad Backed and was actually a pretty simple one. In this room, you need to use Trico to propel you into the sky which usually results in the boy gripping onto the railing at the top like so. To earn the trophy though, you have to land on Trico's back instead of gripping onto the railing. This took a bit of clever positioning to make Trico slam you into the ceiling, which of course resulted in the boy falling straight back down onto his back, earning me the trophy. <laughs> now that these trophies were finally out of the way, I could focus more on the trophy intense care. To earn this trophy, you have to make sure Trico doesn't have any spears left in him before moving on to the next area. On paper, this sounds pretty easy, but I can assure you it's really simple to miss a spear or just actually forget to check Trico in the first place. To be honest, in the first two quarters of the game, there isn't too much to worry about with this trophy, but as you start approaching the ending, it gets harder and harder to keep up with the spears. The first instance of this can be seen in the fight between the two Tricos, where this armored soldier sits there spamming spears for a solid five minutes. The soldier will eventually run out of spears, but it's pretty hard to be certain whether you actually got them all or not, because sometimes the spears will snap in half and can be pretty hard to see. This trophy had me stressing for the majority of the last half, as it was a pretty tedious trophy to redo if I had missed a single spear. I had to triple check Trico every time before leaving a room, just in case I had missed a spear, 
and in the process of protecting Trico from all these spears, I actually managed to unlock another trophy for defeating 20 soldiers with Trico's lightning. All that was left to do was to make it through the final fight inside the Sentinel Tower and the trophy would be mine which was definitely easier said than done. There's just so many enemies in this area that hold spears, and I can only imagine that this area was designed as one final hurdle to trip a few people up on this trophy. I'm pretty sure that I had pulled every spear out of Trico thus far, I made my way to the top of the tower, watched Trico get his tail ripped off again, and then sat there patiently, just hoping I had removed all the spears from his body. As I mentioned earlier, there was a specific trophy that required you to collect all the barrels in your second run to make up a total of 94 barrels. This was for the trophy called Best Friends Forever. And essentially, the 94 barrels unlocked a paintbrush tool that allowed me to paint Trico any color I wanted. I chose the color green and got to work painting his entire body. I don't actually believe that the requirement is that strict due to only painting the majority of his upper half before the trophy ended up popping anyway. Finally, we had reached the last two trophies standing in the way of this platinum, the classic no death and speedrun trophies. These had been a staple in every team eco game this far, and it was fitting to see that these two trophies were the ones to finish off the platinum journey. As you may have guessed, there's not really any way to show you that I didn't die, because of course, I didn't die, nor did I have any near-death experiences. However, what I did have was this really rubbish AI for Trico, ruining my first attempt at the speedrun. I can't really explain to you how much this bugged me off, because after spending a whole hour getting to this point, just for Trico to hit a brick wall and stop functioning like he had been this entire game, really ruined the vibe for this last trophy. What I believed happened was that because I jumped off Trico right here, it made Trico incapable of entering the building. I tried multiple times to call Trico to jump in with me, but each time he would just turn around and jump back down. This left me with no other choice than to restart the run as I had already wasted too much time at this point. After actually making really solid progress on my second speed run, I eventually made it to this area where Trico flies for the first time. And what does he do? He just doesn't want to fly. I was literally right at the end of the game and Trico just started playing his own game instead. Eventually, he did actually initiate the flying cutscene, but there was only so many more moments like that that I could handle before my controller was going to end up in a million pieces. Finally, after sticking through all of Trico's temperamental moments, the end was in sight. I watched as Trico's tail was ripped off yet again and used it to destroy the master of the valley one final time. I said my goodbyes to this beautiful game and sat there frantically skipping the cutscene to make sure I beat it in the fastest time possible. After earning the platinum for all three games, I genuinely felt a bit empty. This video was such a joy to make and for it to all be over actually left me wanting more. These are easily some of my favourite games now and I can confidently say that Shadow of the Colossus has definitely become one of my top contenders. I loved each game individually and I can't believe I didn't play these games sooner. I genuinely recommend that you all give these games a shot, even if it's not for the Platinum Journey but just for the gameplay alone. Also, I want to just say that I'm really sorry I was gone for so long and I genuinely appreciate everyone who has waited patiently for this upload. I tried to make this one a bit longer than usual just to say thank you to everyone who has waited this long. I hope it was worth it and I'll be back with another video soon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye bye!